Hi there, my name is Estelle Trengove and this is my presentation on some Southern African lightning beliefs. In 2009, I embarked on a lightning myth research project and I did that because lightning kills many South Africans. The aim of the project was to understand South African lightning myths and beliefs and to find out whether any of those lightning myths and beliefs increase or decrease lightning injury risk and also whether and how those beliefs should be addressed in lightning safety literature. If you look at the media and you search for lightning kills, then every year stories come up of people who've been killed in South Africa by lightning. Just a little bit of background on um, the dangers of lightning. So rural people are more vulnerable than city dwellers for more than one reason. Firstly, many rural people work outdoors tending the land or herding animals. So they are more vulnerable to lightning strikes. But in addition to that, uh, sturdy buildings in the city tend to keep us safer and they also have electrical wiring and water pipes that can assist in taking a, a lightning surge current safely to ground. The, in rural areas, a lot of houses don't have running water or, or electricity and weaker materials are built used to build houses so it compromises the safety inside those rural homes during a lightning storm. You'll see some figures of the number of people killed or injured by lightning but in fact they, most of that is just a thumbsuck. There are no accurate records of the numbers of people who are killed by lightning. And then some studies say that uh, you can use uh, an approximation of about 10 injuries for every lightning death uh, as a rule of thumb. So potentially very many people in rural areas could be affected. One of the things that I realized during uh, my research into the lightning myths is that the most common mechanisms of lightning injury are not well understood. My apologies if you've already gone through this in one of your other lectures, but um, just briefly, the five most common mechanisms of lightning injury are either a direct strike, and a direct strike means that the lightning bolt connects straight from you, from the cloud to you and the lightning current flows through your body into the ground. The likelihood of surviving a direct strike, I think, are very small. Um, and so people often say that they were struck by lightning but have no visible signs of injury. And in such a case, it's very unlikely that they were actually struck by lightning. I think uh, a lightning flash, if a lightning flash occurs very near you, the sound is very loud and the light is very bright and I think people might confuse um, being actually struck by just having a lightning strike very close by. One of the other um, common mechanisms of lightning injury is a touch potential where you, a person, touches something that is struck by lightning. A good example of that is if the power line is struck by lightning and you're working with an appliance that's connected um, through your house wiring to the power system, then you could get an injury if a lightning surge travels through the wiring system. Um, and that's why it's generally discouraged to work with electrical appliances during a lightning storm. 
The third common mechanism of lightning injury is the side flash. So lightning, like all electrical current, searches for the path of least resistance to go to ground. And if you're, for example, standing under a tree and that tree is struck by lightning, then a person standing under the tree could be a more desirable path to ground than the tree trunk and then a part of the flash or the whole flash could jump from the tree to your body and travel to the ground like that. The fourth common mechanism of lightning injury is the step potential and the step potential occurs because as lightning as the current radiates out from the point of strike, it causes a potential difference. So closer to the point of strike, the, the voltage would be higher and further away from the point of strike, the voltage would be lower. If, for example, an animal was standing with its front paws at a higher potential and its back paws at a lower potential, then again the lightning current might see the animal's body as a path of lower resistance than the ground and then the current could travel from the front feet of the animal through its body and out the back feet to the point of lower potential. And then the, the last common mechanism of lightning injury is the upward leader. So um, I'm sure your lecturer will show you a slide which shows how a downward leader forms and it then attracts an upward leader of the opposite polarity on the ground. And if that upward leader comes off your your head um, or any part of your body, then it could cause um, injury. So let's get started with the lightning myths. This is a story that was published in the Daily Sun some years ago um, where somebody called George's goats were killed by lightning and he lost 14 goats and I read through the story and it says that George said he didn't know whether it was an act of God or witchcraft. And initially I thought, witchcraft? Does anyone really believe that witches can send lightning? So I started to follow that path. I discovered that very many South Africans believe that witches have the power to send lightning to kill people or their livestock or to burn down their homes. The tabloid The Daily Sun abounds with stories about witchcraft and sangomas and muti. What I didn't understand is that there's a distinction between sangomas who use their magic for good and witches that use their magic for evil. This belief is very widespread, not just in rural areas, but also in urban areas amongst educated and uneducated people alike. And many people explain to me that there's a difference between natural lightning and man-made lightning. Man-made lightning is the lightning sent by witches and has a different set of rules to natural lightning, which is the lightning that we see during a thunderstorm. Often when somebody is killed by lightning, a witch is blamed and a sangoma is employed to identify that witch. The so-called witch is often a vulnerable member of the community, like an orphan or a childless widow. Witches are driven out of the community or even killed. This scenario is described in a short story by um, South African writer Paswane Mpe called Brooding Clouds. And in 1994, 70 people in Limpopo province 
were accused of witchcraft and killed. Most people who believe that witches can send lightning to harm you or your possessions also believe that you can use umuti to protect yourself against that man-made lightning. Umuti is a Zulu word for medicine and that it, it's traditional medicine that's made from plants, roots, leaves, stems and bark and from stones and bones and different animal parts. In this picture you can see a muti market in the rural town in Tuba Tuba where I interviewed several of the traditional healers and most of them said they could either give you uh, traditional medicine to protect you against man-made lightning or to protect you against um, natural lightning. This picture is from a muti shop in Johannesburg and um, the muti that they give you is typically buried in four points around your house and then I asked them what if you are still struck by lightning and people said it means that the Sangoma's muti is weaker than the witch's powers so you need a stronger Sangoma to protect you in such a case. One of the oldest recorded stories that I found of um, people with the ability to control lightning came from the Bleak and Lloyd archives. Wilhelm Bleak was a linguist who came to South Africa in 1855 to compile a Zulu grammar and when he arrived in the Cape he was introduced to some San people and he was very fascinated by their language of cliques. There were some San people in the prison in Cape Town and he convinced the governor to let them come and work in his house. But he learned their language and um, spent m many hours writing down their stories. He and his sister-in-law, um, Lucy Lloyd, and together they wrote down 12,000 pages of stories. And one of those stories is the story of Kahara and Haunu. Um, Haunu was married to Kahara's sister, and for some reason Kahara went to fetch his sister back and take her back home. Um, as they were walking back to Kahara's home, Haunu followed them and then it, the story sa says that Haunu stealthily lightened at his brother-in-law. He threw a lightning bolt at him and then a battle ensues where they throw lightning at each other until Kahara finally retaliates with black lightning and there's a footnote to the story that explains that black lightning is the lightning that kills. In the old ethnographic texts and also in more recent studies, uh, people describe heaven herds and a heaven herd chases the lightning away. So it, a heaven herd is typically also a sangoma and when there's a lightning storm, he takes Muti and stands on a hill and chases the lightning away. Uh, when I was interviewing people in Klabisa, I met a heaven herd and you can see him in this picture. He fills those antelope horns with Muti when there's a storm and stands on the hill. He said, when I see the lightning coming, I point the other direction so that it does not strike, strike my neighborhood, but strike somewhere else. In that way, I'm able to protect myself, my family, and my entire neighborhood. And his part of the village pays him a fee to keep the lightning away from their part of the village. 
There are also stories of the lightning bird. Lyle Watson identifies the hammerkop, the Scopus umbretta, as the lightning bird, a herald of thunderstorms. The Hatla in Botswana used the feathers, flesh and dung of the hammerkop in rainmaking ceremonies. Many pedis and Tswana say that, a light, that lightning is a bird that swoops down to eat a specific lizard. And there's a story in a book of traditional African folk tales called Badoli the Ox, in which a young boy has an encounter with the lightning bird. The illustration on this page is from that tale. Another belief is the belief that the Inkanyamba is a mythical snake that lives in deep water pools. Um, sometimes it's described as a snake with many heads. When the Inkanyamba wants to find a mate, it flies through the sky accompanied by lightning. When it sees a glinting pool, it thinks that there might be a mate there, so it dives down into the water and that is when we see a lightning flash. The Inkanyamba could mistake a shiny corrugated tin roof for a water pool and dive down from the sky. So many people believe that one should paint one's corrugated tin roof to avoid it being struck by lightning. The myth that lightning favours shiny objects is also very widespread. In Hogsback, in the Eastern Cape, um, uh, in the mountains, there was a tornado in 1998, and local Tosa people believed that the tornado was the Inkanyamba, a winged snake so fearsome that they do not even say its name. After that tornado, many people made clay models of the Inkanyamba, as shown on this picture below. There are also widespread beliefs that certain trees are never struck by lightning. The Kumani San in the Northern Cape, for example, believe that the shepherd's bush, the Boskia albitranca, or the Vitha tree, is never struck by lightning. Um, there's a picture of somebody's house here underneath the, um, the Vitha tree. And uh, we went and conducted some soil resistivity tests there to see whether it was safer under a shepherd's bush than under other trees. And the tests showed that there, were no, there was no significant difference when compared to nearby soil. So it seems to be a misconception that one would be safe sheltering under a vitha tree. There are also other trees that are identified as lightning trees that are said to protect people against lightning. One of them is the Sisyphus micronata, the buffalo thorn tree, which is shown in the picture below with the red berries. Another one is the Gardenia falkensii, which is also shown with its fruit on the right-hand side picture. And in Swaziland, many people believe that several species of trees repel lightning, including the sausage tree, Kigelia africana, and the Cape Plain tree, Ocna arborea. Another common belief is that a tire on your roof will keep you safe. Um, people also think that it's the tires that keep you safe in a car because the car is insulated from the ground. But of course you are safe in a car because of the Faraday cage effect, because a car is a Faraday cage. And similarly, uh, some people believe that rubber soles will, will protect you against lightning. Um, and whereas they might protect you a little bit against a weak uh, step potential, they almost certainly won't protect you 
if you are directly struck by lightning. So in conclusion, I think a combination of fear and ignorance might make people feel powerless to protect themselves against lightning. I think that whether you do or don't believe that witches can control lightning, we should still educate people to protect themselves against natural lightning. And one way to empower people is to provide them with knowledge through lightning safety information or severe weather warnings. Thank you for listening. And if you have any of your own lightning stories that you'd like to share with me, please get in touch with me on my email, which is estelle.frengove at witz.ac.za. I would be very happy to hear from you. Thank you.